Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Hebrews 3, 7 through 19. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Tammy. Can you all hear me? All right. Good morning. I'm going to pray for us. Can we pray? God, I am well aware that many of us right now in this room are not doing great. We're struggling. There's stress. There's circumstances we can't control that we so wish we could change. There's medical, relational, spiritual, physical problems. A lot of us are hurting, Lord, and we need you. And I pray, Lord, as the body on its own will naturally heal itself, would you help your church, the body of Christ, heal? Help us, Lord, to be there for each other, to lift each other up, in prayer, to bear one another's burdens, to show up, to be encouraging, to say the hard word when it's needed, to point to you, Jesus, again and again and again, and to look to you for healing. Lord, we need healing. We need you in so many ways. I pray, God, at any point in the message today as we hear about the unfaithfulness of the Israelite generation, and we see ourselves so clearly in their unfaithfulness, would you also show us Jesus? Would you help us to cling more strongly to your son? So that no matter what we're going through right now, there is joy. There is joy in the midst of it all. Because you care for us. You came for us. You're leading us home. And you give us your peace and your joy. Help us cling to you. Help us see you clearly, Lord Jesus. May that be true every week here. Every week, help us to take one more step closer to you. Shepherd us, we pray. Amen. I don't have a story. I don't have a quote. I don't have something to try to grab your attention at the beginning of the message today. I just have a simple statement. No matter what we try to do in life, if it's long-term, it's going to require some perseverance. Sometimes we're not going to want to do it. Sometimes we're going to want to quit. And it's going to need perseverance. So how do we persevere? There's a bunch of ways. 
no matter what it is that we're trying to accomplish in our life when it's long term. One of the ways that we persevere is by looking back. We look at the stories of people that came before us, the good, the bad, the ugly, and we learn. We also need each other. We need community to build each other up, to be there for us, and to speak into each other's lives. We need community. We need each other. And we also need that finish line, that goal. What are we working towards? Why should we not quit? Why is it worth it? We need to persevere. And as Christians, persevering to the end, we need a whole lot more than just our own effort to look back into the past and to learn from past mistakes and each other as great as that is and a great vision of what's coming and the goal and why it's worth it. All of that's wonderful, but we need a lot more than that as Christians to persevere until the end. We need Jesus himself. We need Christ. As we're going through the sermon slash letter of Hebrews, we see the same kind of message preached, if you will, over and over and over again in in different ways, same message, Jesus is better. And rather than reminding you of all the ways the, the author speaker has told the Hebrew audience why Jesus is better, all those different ways so far, I just want you to hear those three words. Jesus is better. Do you believe that? Not last week, not last month, Today, right now, in your life, do you truly believe Jesus is better? Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth all of our life and is worthy to persevere and to follow. Because if you haven't noticed, throughout your life and for the rest of your life, there's going to be many options presented to you of something other than Jesus worthy of your attention and your life. From the world, from the flesh, that's you, your own thoughts and imaginations and desires, what you think is best for your life, the world, the flesh, and the devil, all three of those, that trifecta is going to keep throwing options at you. Stop following Christ. He's not worth it. He's not worthy. Spend your life doing something else. Why are you wasting your time? It's going to keep coming again and again and again and again. And so, Hebrews tells us again and again and again, Jesus is better. Here's the main idea for the passage today. Learn from the past, but listen to the Lord. Learn from the past, listen to the Lord. He brings up this past lesson of the wilderness generation in verses 7 through 11 of chapter 3. And we're going to see ourselves in that story. We're supposed to but we're also supposed to learn from it, from those past mistakes. The past lesson of the wilderness generation in verses 7 through 11, then a present right now exhortation to hear God's voice in verses 12 through 15. And then he ends with a kind of, in case this is going above your head or you think it's for someone else, ponder who this message really is for. Verses 16 through 19. So let's look at the first one. The past lesson of the wilderness generation. Look at verses 7 through 11. He brings up this past lesson. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. So we see in this passage, in these verses, both learning from past unfaithfulness, which led to unrest. They did not enter into the physical promised land. Their unfaithfulness led to real ramifications of not resting, as God intended for them to do in the promised land. So look at the beginning of verse uh, 7 here. Therefore, therefore, he's reminding us of what he's spoken of so far. I want you to just simply remember last week what we talked about, because he's speaking of the the Israelite, the generation, and not to model their unfaithfulness. But last week was about lifting up the model of Moses as an exemplary servant. Look at his faithfulness of how he served the Lord. And we talked about the temptation, the easy temptation it would have been for Hebrews at the time 
to revert back to Moses as the primary authority in their life. I mean, who better? He wrote the Torah. He was sent by God as the servant leader to, to rescue the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, right? He acted in priestly ways. He acted in kingly ways. He led the people so well. What a, a temptation that could have been for the Hebrews at the time, experiencing hardship, wanting to take an easier road, stop following Christ. Let's just revert back as, to Moses as our primary teacher and authority figure in our life. He's reminding us of last week. However, as great of a servant Moses was, he was still part of the people of God. Jesus is the one who created the people of God. Moses was a faithful servant, not perfect, but an exemplary servant. Jesus was the perfect servant, the suffering servant who died for the sins of the world and the very son of God who rules over the house of God, over the church. Follow the Lord. Therefore, remembering what we've learned so far, remembering last week, and then he goes on to quote Psalm 95. When you look at this quote today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So pause a second. He says, he's quoting Psalm 95, speaking to the Israelites at that time in the first century, reminding them of the past unfaithfulness of the Israelites, but saying, right now, today, don't harden your hearts as you listen to this, as you remember the past unfaithfulness of your ancestors. Right now, he's saying, pay attention. And he'll bring up this psalm again next week in Hebrews 4, and we'll get into more detail for it. But he's saying, right now, pay attention to what happened in the past. Learn from past unfaithfulness, verses 8 through 9. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in do not imitate the unfaithfulness of the Israelite generation in the wilderness. The example he gives here, as in the rebellion, what is the rebellion? Most believe it's referring to the, the event in Exodus chapter 17. The Israelites were in Rephidim, and at that time and at that place, they grumbled against Moses, the servant given to them to lead them, and against the Lord. They, they complained, they argued, they said these words, is the Lord really among us? Is God really here? And they argued. Now, if you've read through the story of the Israelites in the, in the wilderness generation, was that the only time that they complained and argued? It's like, no. This is some emphatic, like, no. So many times. And we see ourselves in them, do we not? Do we never complain? Do we never argue? It's like, it's laughable. Yes, we do. Psalm 78 says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. How often did they say things to Moses like, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? It was better then. We had meat pots. <laughs> Even though we were slaves. Isn't it so interesting to think that life was better when we were under slavery than it is now? It's like, how could they possibly think that? And then we stop and we're like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> how often do we may think to ourselves, man, life was easier when I wasn't following Christ. Maybe for those of us with the story of we came to Christ later in life and we we more so got into the pattern of developing our own idea of what morality is and really just looking at, like, I'm accountable to myself, right? I make my decisions. And then, we, and then we turn and we give our lives to Christ and we see, oh, that's right. I'm not the one who comes up with the rules. I'm not the one who's the judge of even myself, not to mention the world, but how often might we think, it would just be easier if I wasn't accountable to God. Or if I didn't have a family of God that was going to ch maybe check up on me if I start veering off into a different path. We're part of something much bigger, the family of God. And that, that, that requires some effort on our part. And struggle. And going against what might be some of our natural desires and wants. To follow the Lord. They rebelled. Their hearts were hardened. He says in verse 9, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, where your fathers put me to the test. This idea of testing God, they were continually checking, is God good? Is God true? Is God reliable? Does he really have my best interests in mind? 
He's saying they continued to do that. Even though, verse 9, they saw my works for 40 years. That word saw, I mean, they physically saw it, they experienced it, they understood it. I checked this book called Sparkling Gems by Rick Renner, and he asked the question, what did they see over those 40 years in the wilderness? And if you know the story, God provided for them in miraculous ways. They're in the wilderness. They're not in a city. They don't have the resources to just develop their own food and get their own water, clean water. God provided them miraculously every day for 40 years. What did they see? How much food, how much water is needed for all of those people? There's different ideas about exactly how many Israelites there were. One number, which it could have been somewhere around 3 million people, maybe. How much food, how much manna, bread, would be required for 3 million people every day? Answer, 4,500 tons of manna every single day. Over 40 years, that's 65,700,000 tons of manna. Okay? That's a lot of bread that God provided every single day, and they saw it. On top of that, how much water for 3 million Israelites and their cattle? Answer, 15 million gallons daily for their basic needs. We're not talking, let's get a swimming pool and have fun doing whatever. It's to survive. <laughs> 100 million gallons of water in one week. That's amazing. Not to mention all the times that God shows up supernaturally, right? At Mount Sinai, in the clouds, in fire, fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day to lead them. Spectacular appearances, awe-inspiring appearances of God for the people of Israel. And after all they saw and all they experienced, are they full of faith and trust in the Lord? No, <laughs> they're not. Seeing God work in your life and the people around you, even in miraculous ways, does not ensure a personal, steadfast trust in God. That, that is an amazing reality that speaks to just the human heart, does it not? How much does God have to do for us to say consistently, yep, he knows me. He's going to provide. He, I, I trust him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to follow him. Period. It speaks to the human heart. They were unfaithful. And that led to unrest. Verses 9 through 11. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. Next week in Hebrews 4, we're going to see three different kinds of rest that the author is referring to. Which one is he talking about here? The rest of entering into the promised land of Canaan, also known as Israel, that God promised to Abraham initially and to the people of God, this generation. They were supposed to enter into that land that God promised them, a land where they would find rest. But all of the complaining, all of the arguing, all of the bitterness, all of the lack of faithfulness to God came to a head in Numbers chapter 14, where none of that generation of the Israelites that were rescued out of Egypt, except for two people, Joshua and Caleb, and then every person under the age of 20. Everybody else? Sorry, you're not going in. Are you under the age of 20? Can you raise your hand? All right. If we were the Israelite generation, guess who's, guess who's being, going into that land and being exempt? Just you guys. Can you imagine? Only you. You're starting the next generation. The rest of us, held accountable for those mistakes, died off until that next generation came up. Years and years and years of waiting for all of that generation to die off before they entered into the land. They thought even after all of God's faithfulness and the way that he provided, they decided collectively, except for Joshua Caleb, it's too dangerous to go in despite God's faithful record. So they don't enter, they die off. Here's a question I had, which some of you may have had too. Does the fact that the Israelite generation does not enter into the promised land mean that that generation of Israelites all went to hell? Anyone else thinking that? 
Anyone else wonder that as you read it? No one thought that? I'm the only one? Do I, I don't need to explain it if no one else thought. Someone did, okay, a few, okay. Let me explain it. No. <laughs> okay, so entering the land does not equal salvation. Entering the physical land of Israel did not mean enter, will one day also enter into heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. Why is that the case? There's, there's, a, there's several reasons. Let me give you two of them. First of all, and we don't see it as clearly in this passage, next week as it talks about rest, even the generation that does enter into the promised land, they are promised a future rest. As in, there's a coming rest that even that next generation did not experience. It's not the, the, the be it, the, 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 the end of the journey for them. There was, a, there was a promised rest in the future, still for the people of God. That's one reason. Secondly, if we say that all of the Israelites who died off and didn't go into the land, um, if all of them were those who weren't, weren't truly, didn't truly belong to God and all would end up in hell, that would be saying that Moses, the one who last week is lifted up as the exemplary servant of God, like someone to, to, to imitate and respect, that would, be like, that would be saying that he went to hell. It's just, it's not true. So entering the land did not equal salvation, but it was, it was a rest. It was a gift that God wanted to give to his people, but their unfaithfulness led to missing out on it. It led to unrest. So learn from the past. Listen to the Lord. We see this past lesson of the wilderness generation, but then he gets into the right here, right now, present exhortation to hear God's voice in verses 12 through 15. So in verses 12 through 15, here's what we see. We see that there is the potential of some in the Hebrew audience that this person's speaking to and later Hebrews is written to, the potential of some of them not being believers, the potential of some of them being lost. And then there's this charge to persist and this charge to pay attention now. So the potential of non-Christians that he's speaking to is in verse 12, and there's more of that later in Hebrews as well. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So let me take a step back a second. If you were to talk to an Israelite in that generation in the wilderness and you ask them a bunch of questions, they might sound quite a bit like believers today. I heard D.A. Carson, a, a theologian, author, one of the leaders of the Gospel Coalition explained this a lot better than I'm about to try to do it. But he said, if you talk to an Israelite in the, in the, in the uh, wilderness generation and you, and you had a conversation with them, they might sound a lot like a Christian today. What happened to them? You're, t- you're talking to the Israelite, you're like, what's going on? What's going on in your life? What happened? They're like, we were, we were in bondage. We were enslaved, right? And then God sent someone to rescue us. He sent someone to free us, to, to show, to speak God's word and to reveal God's power and to lead us out of bondage. It's like, check, check. How we got out was because of the blood of the lamb. Okay? And now we're on the way, <laughs> we're on the way to the promised land, right? God is with us. He's with us. But we're not yet at that, re- at that promised land, that rest that God is, is leading us towards. It's like, that sounds a whole lot like a Christian today, does it not? With all those parallels. In the same way, and here's the point I'm trying to get to, that group of Israelites in the wilderness, while the majority of them, we would hope, were truly belonged to God, believers in the Lord, we're going to see them in heaven, not all of them were. In the same way today, you walk into a church, right, Hopefully, we're, we're talking most people are, are genuine. They believe in Christ. They're following. We're, they're, they're sealed on the way to glory. But not everybody is. Okay? Romans 9, verse 6 says, Not all of Israel was Israel. Not all of Israel was true Israel. As in, just because they descended from Abraham and Sarah didn't mean they were truly part of the people of God, the family of God that God has been building throughout time. And in the same way, just because someone says they're a Christian today doesn't necessarily mean that they are. It says here in verse 12, 
take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an, un an evil, unbelieving heart. An evil, unbelieving heart. Take care. Be careful. Make sure. Some of you might say, but wait, didn't he just say he's addressing bro like brothers and sisters? Doesn't that mean that they're all truly brothers and sisters? No, it doesn't. Now, I want to affirm here, we're going to see in Hebrews as we go through it, there's some of the most compelling, most, most strong emphasized passages that talk about the once you truly believe in Christ, you are you, from, from beginning to end, he keeps us, he preserves us. The once and for all sacrifice of Christ is more than enough. Perseverance of the saints, very strongly held up. But it doesn't go against what Jesus taught in Mark 4, for example, of the parable of the soils, that there may be, there will be people who at first seem like they've received the gospel joyfully, glad, gladly. Maybe they were baptized. Maybe they've been attending church and serving for whatever amount of time. But then trouble comes up. Then something happens where the truth about what they really believe comes through, and they, they leave. They fall away. They reject the Lord. The truth is we don't always know. If someone leaves, does that mean immediately they're not a believer? No, we don't know. They might come back. God knows those who are his. God knows who have truly, genuinely given their lives to Christ, who confess their sins and believe in him. The Lord knows. But he's saying, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an unbelieving heart that will, over time, lead you to fall away from the living God. So what, what are one of the best ways to know does someone truly belong to the Lord? Do they tr have their, are they genuine? One of the best ways to know is time. Someone really wise <laughs> uh, used to say, uh, when I, pra I didn't say really wise when I practiced it, but I heard, I heard Pastor Ed say a few times, he was, he's wise, he's wise. <laughs> okay. he, he used to say, time is the biggest snitch, right? Time is the biggest, you guys remember that? Time's the biggest snitch. It reveals, it shows itself. And so, <laughs> What do we do? He's saying, be careful, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. And he gets right into the next part of what do we do? We persist, verses 13 to 14. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today. Exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today. One of the means of perseverance, of persisting in the faith, is by encouraging and exhorting one another. Do you guys remember that one another? message about encouraging and exhorting one another. I'm going to put it up here on the screen to remind us the whole message, and then I'll come back up. No, I'm just kidding. So just real quick reminder of it. Okay, we talked about encouraging, exhorting. It's the same word, because depending on, on the context, it's like two sides of a similar coin. They both involved encouraging and exhorting, strongly urging someone. To encourage someone means to strongly urge them to stay on the path that they're going on. You're doing great. Keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing. To exhort someone also means to strongly urge them, but it means to strongly urge them to get back like you've swerved away from the way you should be going. Right? Based on what we know, like based on our time in the word and what we know that God has taught us, we have to exhort each other. You're, it looks like you're going the wrong direction. right? And we can do that in the moment, we can encourage or exhort someone. Or there could be teaching involved with that about future warnings about the kinds of paths that may come up and how we want you to be on the correct one walking towards the Lord. Exhort one another. How often? Every day. As long as it's called today. How often do we need encouragement or exhortation? It's often. It's frequent. We need that. And we need the grace of God to have the boldness and the fearlessness in the correct times and places to say to somebody something, a word of exhortation, a hard word. None of us are going to enjoy hearing a hard word. I don't enjoy it. I need it. You're not going to enjoy it. You need it. You need someone who knows you, that you trust, that is going to be able to say, hey, I see this in your life. Please come back. Be careful. And we need encouragement to see and to, to as, as God's working in our life, to see in other people the ways that they are, they are doing well in following the Lord and saying, keep it up. Keep it up. 
encouraging and exhortation. Why? Verse 13, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That word hardened means calloused or stiff, indifferent, insensitive, and just... It doesn't take 40 years to get that way. It can happen much quicker. And so we need encouragement and exhortation because sin is deceitful. It will lie to us that it's more secure or it's more pleasurable or it's better to do, to live in a way counter to what God has called us. And so we need each other to encourage and to exhort when necessary. And we need it frequently. Verse 14 says, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. I'm going to say that again. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So let me say that in another way. We never shared in Christ if we do not hold our original confidence firm to the end. Are you seeing what he's saying? All genuine Christians will be genuine Christians at the end of their life. If you truly believe in him now, if you've truly confessed your sins, believe in Christ, he's your Lord, your Savior Savior now, that's going to be true on your deathbed as well. And part of the ways that we persevere and get there is not by going, man, I hope that at the end of it all, I'm still believing and just hope, but we encourage and we exhort one another consistently until then. And at the same time, we don't stress and worry about the future. Remember Jesus' message on the Sermon on the Mount? And so the author, the speaker, gets us to pay attention right now, here, today, verse 15. He quotes Psalm 95, as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, like right now, today, while you have opportunity, in this moment, do not harden your hearts. Listen to what God is telling you. Here's the deal. We are, we are in the moment kind of people, as in we need God freshly today, now. I can't rely on what God taught me four years ago in that I need him today just as much as I did four years ago. I need him freshly. You need him freshly. We need God now. We need to respond to God now at this point in our lives. And I think God teaches us that in a bunch of different ways, just through life lessons, right? Or things that we, that we observe in this world that we need him freshly. So for example, if you leave your garden, any gardeners here, you leave your garden alone for a while, what happens? Weeds gets ruined. Okay? If you leave your food out for a while, too long, what happens? It gets moldy. It gets gross. Unless it's like a cheeseburger from McDonald's, which will last forever. If you don't exercise for a while, flab. If you don't tell someone or show them in specific ways that you care for them, they are going to feel uncared for and unloved. We need it consistently. I remember, uh, my dad's going to listen to this. So my da- when I was 16 or so, I remember we were driving home, and he says to me something like, you know I love you, right? And I was like, yes, I know you love me, dad. So can I just let you know when that changes? <laughs> As in, like, I just, just know that. And I'll let you know if that ever changed. Like, he was half kidding, but... It wasn't as, he didn't enjoy saying it as frequently like as my mom does, for example. And I remember him saying, like, that's not going to go over well if I say that, if I say that to mom. Like, just frequently let, let each other know we care for each other. We love each other. We need it freshly, consistently. We need God now, daily. And we need each other to encourage and exhort one another. So, we learn from past unfaithfulness. We listen to God's voice now. And in case we thought, well, this message was just for the Hebrews at the time. This message is really just for someone else. I don't really need this message. Look at how it finishes. Ponder who needs this message, verses 16 through 19. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? 
And to whom did he swear they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Who is the message geared towards? It's geared towards those who have seen again and again and again the faithfulness of God. It was geared towards the Israelites, the ones who initially were rejoicing when God led them out of Egypt, praising God, singing the song of Moses. Look at what the Lord has done. They were celebrating. It was the same people that became hardened and unfaithful and missed out on what God wanted to give them and what God wanted to do in their life. The message is for the church. It's for those of us who have seen again and again and again the faithfulness of God. The message is for us. There's a quote by N.T. Wright that says, I'm going to finish with two quotes for you. He says, once you stop believing in the God who called you, rescued and guides you, or the future he has promised, you may simply go round and round in the wilderness and never get anywhere. Once you give in to that impulse, you will not only put yourself at risk, but all the other people whose lives you touch will be in danger as well. To persevere, we learn from the past, we need each other in community, and we have this goal ever before us, the future of what Christ is going to bring, the kingdom of God on earth. And so in regards to that goal, I want to finish with this quote. I read this once before in regards to the encouraging and exhorting one another message, and the quote's so good that I want to read it again. It was written by Scotty Smith. He's a Gospel Coalition contributor, and he just shares his heart after he read this passage in Hebrews chapter 3. Here's what he says. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful for the friends, both brothers and sisters, you've woven into my story and journey. Being an introvert, investing my heart in long-term relationships has required and still requires a lot of your grace, grace that you've been faithful to supply. Isolation is no longer an option. Aloneness is a disastrous setup. Self-sufficiency is insufficiency. I've already gripped the handle of a couple of friends' caskets, and other friends will do the same for me one day. More than ever, I want us to finish well together in the gospel. What will this look like, and what will it take, Jesus? While it is still today, how do we love well? How do we presume about nothing and pursue one another in everything? What does spurring one another to love and good deeds look like? My temptation is to treat my easiest friendships like a broken-in pair of Birkenstock sandals. I just enjoy them without much thought or effort. It's a great gift to have a few friends who can finish each other's sentences, endure one another's jokes, appreciate one another's quirks, and accept one another's weaknesses. Surely this is a gospel gift. Yes, yet, Jesus, this scripture I'm praying through, he prayed through Hebrews 3, this scripture I'm praying through today is quite sobering. We're still foolish people, capable of acting out in very destructive ways prone to wander, easy targets for temptation. With all my being, I trust in the grip of your grace and the security of your bride. But your word is very clear. Continuance in gospel faith is a sign of real faith. Continuance in gospel faith is a sign of real faith. That doesn't scare me, but it does sober me. Help us know how to hold each other accountable for believing the gospel, the main accountability we need. Help us take each other's heart struggles seriously. Help us never to minimize or marginalize the deceitfulness and hardening power of sin. Help us preach the gospel to our own hearts daily and to each other with joy and consistency until today segues into the day of your longed-for return. Let us take one another's holiness and health seriously with faithfulness and joy. Amen, I pray, in your all-glorious, graceful name. Amen. I'm going to pray for us as the band comes up and we take communion. Father, it can be scary to think about the future, especially when we read about a generation that sounds a lot like us 
we have a hard time not complaining. We have a hard time not grumbling about you, about the people you've put in our life to lead us in different ways. We grumble, Lord. We're afraid, Lord. We doubt your character. We doubt your goodness. We doubt so much. And so, God, help us learn from your word. Help us learn from those who have gone before us. Help us to engage, not just passively, but actively engage in the community that you've given to us, to speak truth into each other's lives with grace, to sometimes say the hard word, to strongly urge that person we care about to come back, to veer back onto the road, to be part and to obey your design. Because going against the grain of your design just leads ugly splinters for us, Lord. We don't want that. And help us to encourage each other sincerely, not to have to invent, come up with fake things to say, but truly to see through your eyes the ways that, that people are following you well and to spur them on, to motivate them, Lord. And God, may we see clearly, more and more clearly, the future that's coming because of you, Jesus. The future that you are bringing, the kingdom of God on earth, where your glory will cover this world as the waters cover the sea. Where faith won't be needed anymore, you'll be right there. Our eyes will see and perceive. And God, more than any of that, give us Jesus and work in us to want, to desire, to pursue you, to know you, and to care more than just about ourselves, but the people you've put in our life. Bring more, we pray. In Jesus' name.